this night And in the troubled times When I'm all out of fire You're the force that keeps on
I got it. Hey, I did not kill her mic. Uh, it's back. I'm back. Here. What's All up, right. everyone? Welcome to Central. My name's Chloe. This is Pastor Mike. And you can be seated. Hey, if it's your first time here, we want to welcome you to Central, a place where it's okay to not be okay, where you can come as you are, you belong, and we're so glad that you're here. And if it is your first time, we have a new to Central area just in the lobby. We'd love to meet you, answer any questions that you have. We also have a free gift for you, so make sure you check that out. Hey, if you are new, a great way to stay connected to all that Central has to offer you and your family is download the Central Church app. And when you do, turn on your notifications because that'd be a great way to stay connected to Central. And one of the things you're going to see there is two weeks from this weekend is Easter, Easter at, at Central. Central. Are you excited? Yes. Are you going to come, come here on. for Easter, guys? Like, it's going to be a blast. It's going to be such a celebration. If you haven't been to an Easter experience here before, we go all out. It's a huge reason to celebrate. Celebrate, and that is exactly what we do. So I want to personally invite you, and we want to talk to you about maybe how you can be involved and what you can do as part of the Central family, right? Yeah, one of the great ways you can serve is move from Sunday to either Friday night, 7 p.m., or Saturday, 5 and 7. You say, why? Well, you'll be opening up a seat for those in our community that believe the only time you can worship Jesus on Easter is on Easter Sunday. We know better than that, right, church? We can worship Jesus on Friday night, Saturday, so you'll be making room for more. Another thing you can do is invite your friends and family. Yes, totally. We have a lot of fun ways to yes. invite people. Tell them about this, Mike. What's this, this one? This is an invite packet. It's got invite cards and door hangers. You can go throughout your neighborhood, let your neighbors know about it. If you want to be a part of the invite team, our ushers have these pre-packaged. They'll hand them out. Just raise your hand. Raise and say, your hand. Hey, come in. I'll hand it to my friends and family. Yeah. We're praying for over 5,000 first-time guests through your invite. That's right. This is the absolute easiest way to get involved right now. You just raise your hand and you'll receive some door hangers, some flyers, some business cards. Leave it at workplaces, uh, grocery stores, wherever you go. You never know what one invite can do, right? Yes. And then this is a yard sign. If you're going to, how can they get one of these again? As you exit, you'll find these yard signs. So make sure you can grab those, put them in your neighborhood. Great way to let your friends yeah, in your neighborhood. Yeah, these were a little expensive. So if you grab one, make sure you use it. We want to make sure that they get put to good use. But this is a super fun way to invite people as well. And you know, here at Central, we love celebrating life change and what God is doing in the lives of the people right here in our church. People just like Michael. So let's take a chance now and watch his story. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for bringing us together today. Lord, let my story impact other people. Let people find Jesus. Let people find help that are hurting. Speak into their lives. Let, let me see people as they come into church and when they're hurting. So Lord, let me step into their lives and let me help them. And through you, just let me be your hands and feet. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm Michael Vest. I've been coming to Central Church for approximately two years now, and I've been serving on the safety and security team here for about a year and a half. When I first walked into Central, it just felt like home. Everyone was extremely welcoming. I felt like I belonged here immediately, and I felt, uh, felt really good coming here. Before I found Central, um, I was raised in a Christian home, but then slowly kind of strayed away from church and Christianity. Yeah, in 2015, I was diagnosed with melanoma cancer. And the first year I had six surgeries. I remember my first surgery in the hospital, laying in the hospital bed and the nurse came in, brought paperwork for me to sign. And it asked what my religious preference was. And I put atheist. So, I denied Jesus, and though I denied Jesus, I was still a child of God. He still loved me. He still followed me. He was with me through all my troubles and through everything in dealing with melanoma. After the first year and those six surgeries, I was referred to a medical oncologist, and he gave me a 9% chance of living. I started immunotherapy treatments for the melanoma. I had found Jesus again, and I wanted to be baptized. I wanted to make a public confession that I was following Jesus. So during those first four treatments, I was extremely sick, and 
barely was able to get there, but he was gave me some medication. That medication helped me, pepped me up, was able to get me to church and to be baptized. Central meets people where they're at in their journey. People that are hurting can show up here and we can help them. I didn't have any hope for the future, didn't really know what the future was gonna have for me, but when I finally found Jesus, I knew that my hope was in Jesus. And if I kept looking towards Jesus, he would guide me through this and he was there every step of the way. I serve here at Central Church in our safety and security team, and it just brings me closer to God. I want to help people. I'm blessed every day, and I know that I'm doing God's mission. God, in His great commission, asked us to be the light, to step out and be the light for Him, and that's what I want to be. One of the main reasons my wife and I serve here at Central is for our grandchildren and our children. We really want to speak into them and we want to pour into their lives. We want to give our children, give our grandchildren a place and a foundation when they go through troubles. They know where to look to. They know that Jesus is the source of power and Jesus is there with them all the time. In your hard times, in your troubles, God's still there for you. And in the end, He can turn something bad into something good. It's changed my life. It's brought me to where I am today. And God has worked through the bad times in order to get me to the place I am now, and I'm able to help people. Well, what a powerful story. I love Mike Vest. He is someone that's so important around here at Central. If you ever have a chance to meet him, he's always smiling. He always wants to know your story. He loves Central, but most importantly, he loves Jesus and he loves sharing that with others. And his story is so powerful in so many ways, but we're so grateful to have Mike as a part of the Central family. I love the entire Vest family. And right now we come to a time in our experience where we get to give back a portion of what God has blessed us with. Pastor Drew, can you just tell us a little bit why that matters so much? Yeah, in fact, uh, I was leading worship a couple weekends ago and I came off stage and somebody from our baptism team said, hey, there's a 14 year old kid named Gabe who just got baptized. Would you be willing to meet him? And so I jumped out in the hallway um, and I think it was actually during our offering moment where I jumped out in the hallway and started talking to him. And I just asked a little bit of his story. I said, tell me more of why you got baptized. And he said, at age 11, he got addicted to alcohol and drugs. And at age 13, he found himself basically at the bottom of the rope and uh, his, his family found him and they helped him get into a rehabilitation center. And he, so he moved out to Nevada and he was inside this rehab center. And one of the volunteers there started playing Central Church online inside of that center. And he just, he wasn't forced to watch it. He just started watching it and he loved the worship. He loved the message. And eventually he just said, I'm gonna give my life to Jesus. So inside that rehab center gave his life to Christ. And then when he got out, when he graduated the program, the first thing he did is he came straight here to our Central Henderson location and he got baptized during our worship set in line uh, inside the rehab hospital. Um, and I love that Bob even knows this too, like he's ultimately been rescued mm -hmm. and now he's a rescuer right, and he's right. changing people's lives. And so I think it's important when we give, we understand that we are changing lives through our generosity and reaching yes. people all over the world. It's incredible and that's what it's all about. And so if you feel led today to just be a part of that, to, to, if God's tugging on your heart, we've made it really easy to give today. You go to Central.Family, click Give a Gift or go to Central Church dot online as well and to give here today. Absolutely. Well, I love to pray over our offering together. So if you go ahead and bow your heads, close your eyes. God, thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for every single person person joining us for church right now. Lord, thank you for their step of faith and how they're giving to you through their generosity. God, we pray a hand of blessing over every um, act that's taken today, every step. Lord, we pray that you use these finances, not just for um, the step of giving, God, but truly to rescue other people. God, there's so many people that need to know you, Jesus. And so we ask that you would bless those that give and that we would be a blessing to others, that we would see more people come to know you, know your love, know your victories over their lives. God, thank you that you choose us to be a blessing to others. We love you. We give you this time in your son's name, amen. How are we feeling out there, Central Family? You guys feeling all right today? 
Hey, I, I want to teach you a brand new Central Live song called Breathe On Us, and I'm going to sing it once for you, and then I'm going to invite you to sing along with me. Uh, this is the chorus. We'll sing it together. Here we go. Breathe on us, fill us fresh again, and fill our hearts again. It's that simple. Let's try it together. Here we go. Sing it with me. Breathe on us, fill us fresh again, and fill our hearts with the trust that stands. The harshest storm or the fiercest wind, oh God, I know you can. Breathe on us again. Sound great.
that stands the harshest storm or the fiercest wind. Oh God, I know you can breathe on us. Last week was spring break here in Vegas and leading up to spring break, my two kids, Lola and Landon, kept begging me like, Dad, can we please just go to California? Can we go down there and see the ocean and sit on the beach and we wanna go surfing? And so last Sunday we made the decision, we're gonna get in the car and drive down to San Diego. And so we get in the car, we drive down there, I set up a surfing lesson for them. And the day of the lesson we get out there, my kids are getting their wetsuits on, and one of the instructors said, hey, is this their first time surfing? And I said, it's my daughter's second and my son's first time. And he looks at me and he says, I don't know, man, it's pretty rough down there. I just did a first time lesson just a little bit ago. The winds kind of picked up, the waves are crazy. And I saw a rock about waist high in the water. If your kids fall off the surfboard and hit that, they're gonna crack their heads open. So I looked at my kids and I said, back in the car, we're leaving. And <laughs> They begged me, they're like, Dad, please, just let us take this chance, just go down there and learn how to surf. And the instructor looks at me and he goes, here's the deal, how about we go down to the water and if it's unsafe, I won't let your kids get in and we'll reschedule the surfing lesson. And so I decided to trust them and I'm like, I'm not gonna pay you if something happens to my kids. So um, they get down to the water and they get in and I'm watching my kids try over and over for about an hour. And an hour in the lesson, this is what I got to see. My son Landon standing up on a surfboard. And my daughter Lola as well. There's the instructor like, yeah, we, we did it. But you know, I thought to myself, as someone who's not a surfer, I'm so glad I didn't lean on my own understanding of how to surf, that I ultimately, I listened to the instructor and I knew he knew what he was doing. And I thought of this, you know, in seasons of life, when we're going through difficulty, when we're faced with fear, you and I have to trust the ultimate instructor, the one who holds all things together, the one who's in control of the future. We just gotta keep trusting him. Proverbs 3, five through six says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Maybe you're here today, and you're going through a difficult season, I wanna take a moment to just pray for you. If you're needing to just trust God with something in your life, if I can pray for you, even if you're watching online or inside of one of our prison locations, would you just boldly slip your hand up in the air if you need prayer today? And if you're next to somebody with their hand raised, I wanna encourage you to stretch a hand out towards them. Let's just pray, let's ask God to do what only he can do, would you join me? God, right now, we lift up our friends to you. For those who are hurting, for those who are going through difficult seasons. Today we say we trust you. We trust that you're gonna do what only you can do. We don't lean on our own understanding. We acknowledge you for who you are, and we know that this too shall pass. For it's in your name we pray, and everybody said it together, amen.
your family and your children and their children and their children may you say be upon you in a thousand share with you. One is this Friday on all streaming platforms, Central Live is releasing a brand new EP. It includes Little Is Much, You Do Miracles, and The Heart of Jesus. It comes out on all streaming platforms this Friday. So listen to it, share it with your friends. On May 1st, we're going to do a night of worship right here in the room too. Central Live is going to come bring a lot of these songs to that night. It's at 7 p.m. on May 1st. It's completely free. There's free child care. Pastor Judd will do communion that night. It's gonna be really incredible. So make sure you're back for that. Hey, I also wanna give a huge shout out to all those who are watching online and especially those who are watching inside of prisons with our partnership with God Behind Bars through the Pando app. We're so glad you're here today. And in just a moment, Pastor Judd is gonna come share a message of hope. But before he does, I gotta let you know that yesterday was his birthday. And so I thought it would be appropriate and we sing happy birthday to Judd, so would you help me? Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Judd. Happy birthday to Thank you, thank you. You guys, please be seated. Appreciate that. It's good to be in my mid-20s. Very grateful. 
No, man, at my age, you're just thankful that you made it through another, another round uh, around the sun, and uh, you're grateful for uh, every year that God gives you, so I'm very, very grateful, thankful to be here and to be with you. So I remember when I was 14 years old, um, had some friends over one night, and we all stayed the night at my house, and we got the bright idea that we were going to sneak out around midnight and go down the street, and my neighbor he left his car in the driveway with the keys in it. We're going to take his car for a little joy ride. So we, we sneak out the window because we're, we're real smart. We go down the street, and uh, now this is a long time ago, Amarillo, Texas, so, you know, people just left their keys in their car back then, left them unlocked, whatever, in the driveway. So we, we get the car, we put it in, in reverse, we push it back, and then we push it down the street because we didn't want to wake anybody up. And then we fire the car off, you know, and we're off on the road, music's cranking, I'm driving, feeling so old, 14 years old, you know, like I'm the man. It's a Chevy Impala. Come on, man. And I remember we were having a great time, and then somewhere along the way, my buddy in the back seat got sick and threw up all over the floorboard of my neighbor's car. And I'm like, oh man, we gotta clean that up. I can't take my neighbor's car back and put it in the, he's gonna know then. He would have probably known anyway, but in my mind at 14, I thought we were, we were being sly. So we have to get up a plan to clean the car and I'm like, okay, well there's this car wash, it's like a 24 hour car wash with the vacuum cleaner and all that and it takes change. So you know, we pull in and, and we uh, send my friend who threw up, we're like, you gotta go across the street and get change. We had some dollars, some bills, you gotta get change quarters so that we can you know, vacuum all this up in the back seat. So he goes across, it's about two in the morning, he comes out of that convenience store and a police car pulls up. And we're all sitting in a quote unquote stolen car at the car wash and my dad thinks we're asleep in my bedroom. I'm like, this is not good. They put him in the police car and they drive away. And I realize I just have this little window of time until the police call his mom, who then is gonna call my dad and then I'm dead. So, man, as soon as that police car pulls away, I throw the car in in gear, and I'm driving as fast as I can. I got to get home, climb back through my window, and act like I'm dead asleep before the cops call my dad, and, you know, there's something to pay, if you know what I mean. So I screech up into my neighbor's um, uh, uh, driveway. I put the car in park. We didn't clean the mess up. Sorry, bro. Um, We jump out. I run to the house, I come around the corner running, middle of the night, and there's my dad standing in the door. His hair is all wild, he's got a, I still remember a blue robe on. My dad was six foot three, former master sergeant in the army, World War II veteran, trained soldiers to fight in the Korean War. I come, around the, I come around the corner and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm so dead. And my dad, you know, by the way, I found out later that my friend got arrested and taken in because he matched a description of a mugger who had been reported in the area. I'm like, come on, give a guy a break. Anyway, we got in so much trouble over that. But here's the thing, like, I was thinking about my dad and seeing my dad in that moment. <clears throat> Sometimes I misinterpreted like my father's heart. I knew he loved me, but I didn't always understand his rules. I didn't always understand his thinking. My dad was a was a tough dude, man. And like you know, he, you know, he, 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 there were no like suggestions around our house. It wasn't like, hey, could you could you maybe do the dishes? You know how we parent in the modern world, like, come on, come on, son, man, it's your turn, bro. Like I'm trying to negotiate with my son. No, my dad, like, you live under my roof, do, do the dishes. You know, I mean, it's just a different era. I grew up a long time ago. I mean, back then when you got home after school, you know, today you don't let kids out of the driveway. You don't, you don't let them out of the apartment complex, right? You don't let them out of the immediate area. When I get home, I, I walk in and my, my parents would be like, well, you know, be back when it's dark. And I'm just off, man. It's like you only had one rule, don't die. Come back when it's dark. 
I didn't let my kids out of the driveway, y'all. It's like, you want to ride your bike? You can, here's a little 20-foot area. Do a little circle right there. That's all you get. Serial killers out here, crazy people on every block. I'm not, you just do a little circle right here. My parents were like, man, just don't die. Have fun, you know. I, it was crazy. Like, like, you'd be out and about. If you got thirsty when I was growing up, man, you just, you just grabbed a water hose. Like, there was any old water hose that was hooked up anywhere. Could have been yours. Could have been somebody else's. It didn't matter, man. You grab that thing, and you just chug whatever's in it, bacteria, water, germs, all the things, right? You like, oh man, you know, you just get a drink and then you, you, did, who, you just keep on walking. I mean, some of you wouldn't even let your kids drink out of a water hose today. Oh, you got to have bottled water. <laughs> this is a different era, man. We didn't even have seatbelts back then. I'm not saying it's right, but you just like rode anywhere you wanted in the back of the car. I remember like laying up, you know, above the back seat. Like, I'm just prepared to be a missile launched if I'm, if we wreck. This is a different era, right? But I didn't always understand my dad. You know, he had rules. He had, there were all these things I had to do. He had expectations. And, and then I went through a phase, and almost all of us go through this phase where you know, I thought he was kind of a dummy. I thought I knew more than he did. I thought I was smarter than he was. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? I started thinking like, he doesn't understand what it's like to live in the world. He doesn't understand what it's like to live today. That's my dad who fought in World War II, been in the Battle of the Bulge, doesn't under, I, I know more than him. But that's what teenagers do. And it's only later in life that you start to respect again your parents and realize, hey, maybe they weren't so dumb after all. <laughs> maybe I'm the one that was dumb. And uh, maybe they actually had a lot of wisdom and insight to offer, but I misunderstood his heart about several key things. And I think sometimes we do this with our heavenly father. Like sometimes we look at his commands and his expectations on our lives. We, sometimes we look at things like, you know, the moral code of the Bible or ethic or sexual purity kind of standards or whatever. And we're like, man, I, you know, I, I, we think we know better. We think, you know, we, 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 we think we actually know and we don't we kind of misinterpret like what God's heart would be. But I believe our Heavenly Father has commands and instructions for us to follow and principles for us to follow because he knows how we're created and he knows this will lead to a better, blessed, wonderful life if we will follow his way. He actually knows what's best for us. And he has a heart, not just for us, but for others. Sometimes the religious miss the heart of God. I mean, you look at Jesus, in Luke chapter 15, the religious leaders come to Jesus and they ask him a question. They say, hey, why do you spend so much time hanging around sinners? You know, like, why do you hang around people that kind of, you know, don't necessarily have it all together, they don't have it all worked out, they don't come from the right families or whatever, and they literally ask him, Jesus, why do you eat with sinful people? In other words, these are religious people. They, they're trying hard to follow after God. They're, they're trying hard to be faithful, but they've kind of misinterpreted God's heart when it comes to people who are hurting and lost and far from him. And so Jesus responds to this by telling three stories that emphasize God's amazing grace. Luke chapter 15, the story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost coin, the story of the lost son. All three of these stories are very similar. Some argue that it's just one parable in three parts that it's making one big point instead of three. But the idea is this, something of great value has been lost, a, a, a sheep, a coin, or a son. And the owner is willing to go to extreme lengths to find that which has been lost. And there's a progression. So in Luke chapter 15, Jesus first tells the story to answer this question, why do you eat with sinners? Why do you spend so much time with sinners? He says, well, it's a shepherd who lost um, a sheep. He leaves the 99, he goes after the one. So I've never seen this before, but when you look at Luke chapter 15, there's this progression. Will the, will the father have a heart to go after one out of 100? Yes. Then you get to the next story, there's 10 coins. One of them gets lost. Will the father, or the, or the owner of the coin, the woman, will she have a heart to search for one out of 10? So one out of 100, then one out of 10, then there's a story of two sons. What if it's just one out of two? Will the father have a heart to go after the lost one when it's one out of two? And in all three stories in Luke 15, you see that the father's heart 
is for his kids who may be far from him. In fact, I think Luke chapter 15 will give you insight into the heart of God like no other chapter in the entire Bible. It's a brilliant, brilliant description of God and his goodness and his love for you. And listen, when we're, we're gonna talk today about what's often known as the parable of the lost son. You may have heard this. This is Jesus' most famous story. But I would tell you, this story really, I don't believe it's about the lost son. A better title for this story would be the, the story of the forgiving father. Because what we're gonna see today is that this is, all three of these stories really are about the father or the shepherd or the, the, the woman, the owner of the coin. All of them are about the heart of God and what God is willing to do. God is willing to go to great effort for his kids. You see it again and again. And then there's a celebration when they're found. So this is about the heart of God. But let me tell you the story, Jesus' most famous story. You've probably heard this. Hopefully you'll hear something new this time. If you haven't, lean in, because you should know this one, all right? A father has two sons. One son comes to his father and says, hey, dad, yo, can I get my inheritance early because I'm out of here? Now, we hear that today, and we're like, okay, so the son comes, he requests his inheritance, but we don't really put together, like, all the dynamics of how the original hearers would have heard that. They would have heard this story, and when they heard that right out of the gate, they would have been shocked, like, whoa, you mean this son actually goes to his father and asks for his inheritance early? Because here's what it's like saying. It's like saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. And let's go ahead and act like you're dead and you give me my share of the inheritance early, it would have been seen as shameful, horrific, terrible that this guy, that this son even made this ask. Not only shameful to the family and not considerate of the family's needs, the father would then be expected to divide up the assets, take a third of his entire wealth and give it to the son. Well, how do we know that the rest of the family is even gonna survive? How do we know they're gonna have food to eat? How do we know that like the village is gonna make it because they're part of a small village community? Like all of these were questions questions the kid didn't care about. So when he says, give me my inheritance early, he's saying, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with my family. I don't want anything to do with this village or this way of life. Now, the original hearers of Jesus' story would have expected that Middle Eastern father to slap his son across the face and then tell him he's disowned for the rest of his life. Get out. But to their shock, as Jesus tells the story, the father agrees. He says, okay. And he divides up his estate and gives his son his portion of his inheritance. Now, interesting, he wouldn't even have been able to do that in his own village. He would have had to travel to sell part of his estate because nobody in his village would have given a cent to this family because they didn't want to participate in that, what was happening. That's how embarrassing it was. He would have had to travel somewhere else, sell some of his resources, come back, give a third of them to his son, who has now humiliated the family, destroyed their reputation, humiliated them in the eyes of their fellow villagers, and, and then the Bible says he goes away to a faraway country, right? In other words, the land of the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, okay? Goes to the, wait, basically, he goes to Vegas, the text says he engages in, quote unquote, wild living. In other words, he goes to Vegas and he's, he's living la vida loca, man. It's woo! Right? The whole thing. He's living in wild living. He's spinning extravagantly. He's doing the whole thing. And here's the thing. Sin can be fun for a while, but it always leads to the same place. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The payment ultimately is death. Spiritual death, emotional death, even physical death, if you take it to its furthest extreme. And so the son finds himself in the usual spot. Eventually, the party's over, you know. Eventually, the lights, the lights turn off. All, all the fair weather friends, the party friends, Look, when the money isn't flowing and the stuff isn't flowing and the party isn't flowing, they're gone. And that's where he finds himself. In Jesus' story, it says a famine hit the land. All his friends deserted him. And now he's got no money and no friends. Let me tell you where sin always eventually ends up. You go from wild living to then hard living to then lonely 
living. You're by yourself, by yourself with your sin. He's hungry. He has to take a job taking care of a little herd of pigs, a little pig farm. Now, a Jewish audience would have heard that and been like, what? Serves him right? Dishonor your father like that. Go away to the far country and live wild. Now you're with the pigs. Why is that a big deal? Because pigs were unclean animals. He's, he's with the, and pigs would have probably been associated in most of the original hearers' minds with sacrifice to pagan gods, like to Greek gods. So here he is with the pigs, you know, at the pig farm. And he's watching them eat the pods, little pig slurping around. You know, pig, pigs are nasty, man. You see them on this. I mean, there's little pet pigs now, you know, like all these little Instagram, you know, my little pet pig. Uh, you see this on Instagram? You know, man, I'm always like, dude, is that, is that real? But then, then I recently saw a reel that was like the real pigs in the mud, like, yeah, baby, yeah, let's get down in here. They got, the, they got nasty all over them, you know, and they're just like slurping around, like, yeah, that's, that's a pig. Even our little dog, Stella, like, like she loves this wet food. It's so nasty. We put this wet food out, gross, smells gross. She's like, ah. you know, she just mauls it, man. Like, she doesn't even look like, doesn't even breathe. She gets it all eaten. She comes over and wants to lick you. I'm like, no, man, you go, go lick yourself for a little while first. Work that out. This guy's so hungry, he's looking at the pigs, slurping in the, jer in the junk, looking at them eating the pods, in the, all the nasty down there, and he's, he's like, man, it'd be awesome if I could eat some of that. The Bible says he comes to his senses. Literally is what it says. He finally says, he says to himself, is how it could be translated. He says it to himself. In my father's house, even the hired servants eat better than this. He says, I'll go, I'm going to go home. And I'm going to say to my father, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But let me come on now as one of your hired servants, and, and I'll work for you. Now, whether this was the moment of like what the Bible would call repentance, which means to turn around, where the, where the prodigal son, if you will, the lost son, fully came to the end of himself, hit his rock bottom, came to his senses, turned around to go home to his father or spiritually to go home to God. Whether this was the moment or not, I, I don't really know. So, somebody suggested that the line that he said to himself, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you, the line he's going to tell his father is an exact quote from Pharaoh earlier in the Old Testament, and that the Jewish audience would have understood this, that Pharaoh was trying to avoid certain plagues, and so he says to Moses, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you. And you know what it says right after that? Pharaoh hardened his heart. I read one commentator who suggests that it may be at this point that the lost son isn't repenting. He isn't turning his life around, but he's desperate, and he's hungry, and he's still scheming. Come on, you know people like this? <laughs> some of you have been like this in your life. Like, you should have hit bottom 15 times ago, but dude, you're stubborn. You're hard. You kept scheming. You kept trying to work an angle. I'm going to get out of it. I'm going to work it out. I'm going to go home. I'm going to work for my dad for a little while, and then I'll get a little more money, and then it's back to Vegas, baby. <laughs> right? I don't know. But either way, the son heads home. In Jesus' story, when he finally comes around the corner, here's what we read. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 20, we get to the red word, say this with me. It says, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he what? Ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And there's so much here, but, but first I want you to notice the father ran to his son. Listen, as this is a picture of God in his heart, God runs to restore those who return. He runs to restore his son. And if we want to have a heart that's like God's, and again, I think this story is primarily about God and his heart. If we want that kind of heart, then we've got to run to those who return as well. I don't know if you uh, watched the Super Bowl this last year. Any, anybody who watched the Super Bowl, all the Chiefs fans are like still gloating, you know. 49ers fans aren't really talking much about it all this time later. 
In the third quarter, there was a moment where play got interrupted a little bit because there was a streaker who ran out on the field. Woo! Apparently, he wasn't totally naked, according to the Review Journal. He still had some clothes on, thank God. But he's out there streaking away. In fact, he got arrested, and, and he said later, uh, I read this in the paper, he said, I literally just paid $42,000 to go to jail. I think that was the price either of his ticket or his and his buddy's tickets to the game. Forty-two thousand. which, first of all, dang. <laughs> People, man, it's crazy, right? But then secondly, like, wow. And he said, like, I, I, I thought about it. I only want to live once, and I, I, you know, I don't want to look back in the rest of my life and have regrets for not doing things. And I'm, I'm reading this, and I'm like, bro, you need to raise your vision. You need to reach a little higher. If, if streaking at the Super Bowl is what qualifies for you as I'm living my life, think higher. Anyway. Now, some people have said maybe he placed a bet. You heard this probably some people. Like, he placed a bet that there would be a streaker at the Super Bowl, and then he made sure there was one. Uh, I haven't heard that confirmed. Anyway, people say all kinds of things. Who knows? $42,000 run, though, that's an expensive run. But probably not as expensive as the run the father made to his lost son. Fascinating in Jesus' story, it says the, the father ran to his son. Now, first of all, he was waiting for his son. Did you catch that? He's waiting. It could have been years. We don't know. It could have been months. Like this son has embarrassed him, shamed him, turned the family inside out, upside down, shamed him in the village, and then left and gone off. And even after all of that, the father still peek around the corner. Just wait, watch, pray, hoping like this heart sick individual for his lost son to come home. Parents, you know this. There is something about a parent and their love for their kid. Even if you have to have boundaries with that kid, even if they have broken your heart and destroyed so many things in your family, even if everybody else writes them off, you still long for them to come home. You still long for them to turn their lives around. You still wait and you watch and you pray. Right? That's a father's heart. That's a mother's heart in the best sense. And, and that's what God's heart is like. Can you imagine him alone, stepping out of the little home onto the road and looking out a, a far way off, praying day after day after day? Some of you can imagine it because you're living it. Keep living it. Keep praying. Keep believing Keep watching. The whole world may write off your son or your daughter, but you don't need to because the heart of the Father is also that heart towards them. The Father waits and he watches. And then it says, he sees him a long way off. And he runs to him. You see that? There's a couple things I want, I want to flag up to you. First of all, uh, that word run is not just like, like a trot, you know, some of you, you think, you, you get out, you think you're running, like you're exercising, and you're like, I'm killing it, man, I'm killing the game, yeah, you know, you're like, I'm running, man, I'm, I'm awesome, you know, I see you out there, like, you're kind of like walk running, you know, I just need a break, that's not, that's not, that's not what this word run means, there were Greek words for run. This word run, Paul uses it later in the New Testament to refer to an Olympic runner. So this father is running. I'm talking about embarrassing running. You don't keep your cool and your composure running like this. You know what I'm talking about? You have lost yourself running. It's like back in PE when you really let it go. Ah! The father is running. Now why that's surprising is all of our research shows us that from that era, in the Jewish world, in the Middle East, a more mature, grown man did not run publicly because that was shameful. That was beneath you. That was dishonorable, right? So the fact that he ran to his son and the fact that he ran this way meant he would have had to hike up his robe, show those sexy old man ankles, 
and run, baby. The old PE run, the embarrassing run, the shameful run, the run that says, I don't care what anybody else thinks. That's my son. It's my son. Now, they also had a, a tradition, a ritual that happened. We know about it from a little later period, a couple hundred years after Jesus' life, what's called the Talmudic period, but the assumption is this probably in tradition would have gone all the way back to Jesus' era. In the Talmud, if a son lost his inheritance to non-Jewish people, to Gentiles, then that son was to be brought before the village put on his knees before the village. They would gather around him. They would take a pot filled with grain, break it at his feet. It was called kazaza. And they would say to basically, you are forever exiled from our village. You are cut off. That's how intense this stuff was. Like, this was an honor culture. It was full of love and acceptance and good things and kindness. But when you messed with honor, when you messed with the family's honor, when you dishonored your father and your village, and then you squandered your inheritance on Gentiles, like, you were cut off, baby. Don't come back. They would break that at your feet. And some have suggested the father ran to the son to get to him before the villagers did. Because the villagers would have shamed him. The villagers would have circled him up and cut him off and reminded him he has no place there. But instead, the father shames himself, takes the attention off the son who's come home, runs and embraces him and kisses him to say to everybody else, I'm the offended party and I say it's okay. Right? So he runs to him and he embraces him. It's this amazing picture of the heart of God. God runs to those who return. So remember this when you have that annoying person at work this week. Remember this when you're, you look in the mirror and you're disappointed in yourself. Sometimes when we make mistakes, when we fail, we kind of write ourselves off. We think God doesn't have a place for us. We think we can't be forgiven. We think we can't be free. Sometimes we pull back. We pull back from our faith. We pull back from God because we've done something stupid or we've made a mistake. But listen, you can always get up and run to your heavenly father and he will will run to you. That's the image that he gives us of his heart. You just get up and run to him and he will run to you. Not only that, the father will not only run to you, but then he will restore you. Restore those who return. So the father takes the son, he kisses him, he hugs him, he's, he's, he's so thankful that he's home, and then the son begins his speech. Check this out. Luke 15, 21. It says, his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer what? Worthy of being called your son. And some people say, well, this is actually the moment when the son breaks down, when the son realizes he has truly come home and hit his bottom. And what was the difference between this moment of confession and the earlier moment of confession when he was in the faraway country? The difference was the father and the grace the father showed him, the undeserved favor, the father that ran to him when everybody else would write him off, the father that embraced him and kissed him and loved him and literally didn't even let him speak before he got a word out. He didn't say, do you feel real bad? Talk to me about how bad you feel and then we'll talk about whether you're accepted. He threw his arms around him and said, you're home, welcome home. And that, that's the power of amazing grace. When you realize that's how God loves you in Jesus Christ, when you realize he forgives you in him, he saves you, he restores you, he's not interested in your excuses, he's not interested in your speech, he loves you because he created you, you're in his image, you are his son, you are his daughter, and he embraces you because of that, because you're his child. It's not about your performance. It's about God and his goodness. And that is a unique thing about Christianity and the message of Jesus. In Buddhist literature, there's a story very similar to the prodigal son. In Buddhist literature and in Jesus' story. So you've got a son in both stories that goes away, lives a rebellious life. Then the son comes back to his father. He comes back home. But here's the difference. In the Buddhist story, 
The son has to work for years to repay his debt and work his way back into the family's good graces. But in Jesus' story, there's immediate forgiveness. There's immediate grace. There's no probationary period. There's no, you got to work it off, right? In Jesus' story, it's all about God and his goodness. That's why we say Christianity isn't really about what you and I do. It's about what God already did. He did it on our behalf. And so look at this. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 22, it says, his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. Ha! Well, he doesn't deserve that. That's the point. He doesn't deserve it. But it's not about him. It's about the heart of the father for his kids. Yeah, what he did was terrible. He embarrassed the family, destroyed their good name, hurt their reputation, damaged them in the village, did all kinds of difficult things for that family. But the father still loves the son. We must celebrate with the feast for this what? Son of mine. You see this? In his mind, he's got a speech worked out. You remember the speech? He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say to my dad, uh, I'll just be one of your hired servants. You remember this? I'll, I'll just be a hired hand. But the interesting thing is, the father cuts him off before he gets to that line. That was the last line in his speech, and the father cuts him off before he ever gets there. And then he says, no, 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 you don't come back as a servant. You come back as my son. You come back as my daughter. He says, this is a son of mine. He was dead. He's returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. So the party began and they began to celebrate because that's one of the things we learn about the heart of the father. He celebrates new life. He celebrates new life and he wants to celebrate new life in your heart and in your life in your friends' lives and in our community. So he says, man, let's throw a party and let's celebrate all that God has done. And everybody's at the celebration, but one person, the older brother, that older brother is standing outside, and he's already heard the word, my loser brother came home. That little. <laughs> Give me a few minutes with him. He won't be back. He embarrassed our family. He shamed us. He hurt us, and then he went away, and now he comes back, and he gets a party. And, and you know what? In the story, the older brother even says, he says to his dad, he says, hey, I'd love to have had a party with my friends. Kill the fattened calf. None of that happened. So he's actually standing outside. He won't go in. Big celebration. He's not going in. His father has to go out and find him. And I love that as a father can, he does. Because he loves his other son too. His other son who's now lost. Who's now on the outside. And he goes and he finds him. And this is what he says to him, Luke chapter 15, verse 31. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me. Don't forget this. Everything I have is yours. Somebody's going to need to hear this today. Somebody who's never really strayed. Somebody who's never really gone down the crazy road. Somebody who never really did wild living. Somebody who's always sort of been there, towed the line, showed up, gone to church, done the thing, done what's expected, always, but never really got the attention, never really got the celebration, never really had the party, never really had the testimony, never really had the story, just always there, faithful, boring. Look at this. What's the father say? Everything I have, everything I have is yours. It's all yours. But then he goes on. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and he came back to what? Life. You don't miss this. When you come back to God, you're not just like an okay person getting a little better. You're not just a person that's got a few problems getting a few of them worked out. You're a dead person coming back to life through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was lost, but now he's found. And so they party and they celebrate. And, and who's that for in Jesus' story? That's for the religious leaders. 
the ones who started Luke 15 with a question, why you hang out with simple people? Just let me tell you a story about God's heart. And then he says, you know, there's this older brother and he doesn't want to come in. It's almost like Jesus is inviting them to the table, the religious, come join us. Come sit down and eat. These people aren't that scary. And the father loves them. And you got to rub shoulders with them for them to see that love of the father in you can impact their life. Come in and celebrate what God is doing in other people's lives. Listen, Jesus' story reminds us that God loves you even when you're lost. He loves you even when you're on the wrong path. He loves you even when you're running with the wrong crowd. He loves you when you're living wild, when you're living hard, when you're living lonely. He loves you even when you don't love yourself. He loves you through all of that, and it's his grace and love that can turn your life around if you let it in. It's amazing grace. It's amazing grace. Two things I would ask for you to think about this week. One is in your own life. Ask yourself, have I really accepted and received that goodness and grace from God? Realize he loves you and this story is to teach us about the heart of God. And then secondly, maybe pray, join me. I've been praying all week. God, give me my neighbors, my friends, give me some people to share my faith with that maybe haven't heard or don't know about the love of the Father. I know he's waiting. I know he's watching. He's wooing. And I want to work with him to invite others to come home so that the Father can throw his arms around them, spiritually speaking, and bring them back home to him. Easter's a great chance to do that. Let's invest and invite and see God move and work powerfully in people's lives. But God is a God who runs to those who return. And may we be a church that runs to those who return. Will you bow your heads with me? Close your eyes. And if you're here today and you've never crossed the line of faith, I'd love to invite you to follow in a simple prayer with me to just open your heart to God and come home to your heavenly father. Say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. And friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer, if it's your commitment, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Just make eye contact with me just to say before God, say to me, you're going to follow him and trust him in your life today. God bless you guys. Thank you. Hands going up around the room. Thank you guys. Bless you guys. Thank you. Let's reach out to him today. Thank you. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. God, we love you. I thank you for each person just reaching out to you. I pray you'll fill them, restore them, heal them, do an amazing work in their life as they follow you. We thank you for your heart for people. May we learn from it and be inspired by it. We give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.